this seventh program of the Academy of the North American Unitarian Association, NAUA. My name is Stephen Palmer, and I will be the social host for this program. My colleague, John Smith, is providing the technical support, and we'll be recording the program uh, up through the, uh, the end of the presentation. We will not be recording the question and answer session. Um, our speaker this evening is Kevin McCulloch. Kevin is a lifelong Unitarian Universalist, raised in the Atlanta, Georgia area, and was active in UU youth programs while he was growing up. He attended Haverford College in Pennsylvania, where he studied religion and was a co-leader of the UU campus ministry. This led to his being recruited into the UUA youth, uh, young adult and campus ministries working group. And he spent several years consulting for the UUA. Kevin then attended the Candler School of Divinity at Emory University, where he earned a master's degree in theological studies, specializing in American religious history, studying with Professor E. Brooks Holofield. He also studied uh, American religious history at the University of California, Santa Barbara, before resuming his career in software development. Kevin moved to Washington, D.C. in 2012, where he was a member of All Souls Unitarian Church and co-taught Unitarian Universalist history with the Reverend Rebecca Parker. In 2020, Kevin returned to the Atlantic area, uh, Atlanta area to care for his elderly parents and now attends UU Metro Atlanta North Congregation in Roswell, Georgia. Kevin is a member of NAUA and is the editor of our Liberal Beacon newsletter. Uh, Kevin's topic this evening is timely, considering what is happening currently in Unitarian Universalism. This is not the first time that there have been major disagreements and divisions within our denomination. The title of Kevin's presentation this evening is Revisiting the Broad Church, Lessons from the Unitarian Quest for Consensus, 1865 to 1895. So we welcome uh, Kevin McCulloch um, to, uh, to this program. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Stephen. I really appreciate it. Um, and hello, uh, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Um, as as Stephen sort of mentioned, uh, I did uh, somehow contract COVID the afternoon <laughs> that I was scheduled to to give this talk back in October. It wasn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't describe it as a severe case, and I, you know, I, I wasn't sort of being rushed to the hospital. It was basically just a really nasty flu, and so I, you know, was kind of sick as a dog for a few days, and then you know, I got better. But uh, um, but I'm delighted to be here with you guys tonight. Let me uh, go ahead and turn on uh, my screen sharing. Um, and uh, some slides for you guys. So, uh, so yeah, so the topic of tonight's talk um, is Revisiting the Broad Church, Lessons from the Unitarian Quest for Consensus, 1865 to 1895. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, by, by way of sort of introduction to, to what I'd like to talk about tonight, I thought I would just kind of start off by just talking a little bit about, you know, my approach to uh, studying and teaching uh, Unitarian and Universalist history. Um, there, you know, there's sort of different approaches that that uh, Unitarians take to sort of, you know, talking about our history. You know, what the, the, the one that I kind of grew up with is the sort of the boosterist approach, you know, which tends to, to emphasize kind of how we've always been pretty awesome and ahead of our time. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, so it, you know, kind of emphasizes how you know, early we were to adopt, uh, you know, progressive ideas about justice. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I, and I think that that's great. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot to be proud of there. Um, you know, more recently we've, we've seen a kind of a, you know, sort of opposite uh, mirror image of that approach, which is to kind of emphasize all the ways in which we have 
historically been sort sort of privileged and clueless and elitist, <laughs> you know, which is which is also kind of true, you know. I mean, particularly on the Unitarian side, we definitely came from you know sort of the upper crust of Boston. So, you know, there's there's a lot to, to sort of criticize there. But I try when I when I sort of talk about our history, but you know, not, not, not to sort of you know emphasize one or the other, you know, to kind of talk us up or talk us down, but just to try to kind of understand the the particularly uh, you know peculiar phenomena that that particularly on the Unitarian side, um, you know, just this the sort of the kind of the amazing American story that that it is. Um, you know, it's the history of a group of uh, congregational Christian churches, uh, you know, kind of Calvinist Puritans originally, uh, who came under the sway of the Enlightenment and embraced uh, liberal ideals. And that's just really fascinating, the, the way in which, uh, you know, our Puritan forebears became liberals. Um, and, and, and more interesting to me than sort of a story about how kind of we were always destined to be great or how we've always been, you know, sort of wrong. Um, so part of that story, uh, you know, kind of through the ages, is is that it's it's a story of just constant evolution uh, in terms of religious thinking, um, and and a fair amount of of conflict, you know, or or at least a disagreement about what it means, you know, to be a Unitarian. Um, there there has always been sort of a uh, um, a kind of a low level struggle of, over self definition happening among us. Um, and, and that sort of means that we've, we've always sort of been in danger of growing apart. Um, and we've hit a, you know, a, a handful of crisis points, right? You know, you have the original Unitarian controversy, you have the emergence of transcendentalism, you know, you sort of have this period I'm going to be talking about, you have the emergence of humanism in the early 20th century and so forth. Um, and, you know, and, and in all these, you know, cases, there, there have, you know, been, you know, some severe arguments about what we are, what we should be. But in the end, the, the tolerant voices have generally won out and we have managed to kind of stay together and to evolve. Um, but of course, you know, the, the, the initial, you know, uh, sort of origin of the Unitarian Church was, was a painful schism um, among the, you know, the, the sort of the Calvinist Congregationalists and their, and their liberal uh, co-religionists. Um, and that was, and that was a, a just a split, <laughs> you know, those, those churches went their separate ways. So, so, you know, so there have been schisms in our past, you know, we were kind of born in one, um, and there's sort of no guarantee that that won't happen again. And, you know, as, as I think everyone, you know, sort of involved with, with NAUA is, is, uh, is aware that, you know, we're kind of in, in an inflection point right now. Um, you know, the turn towards a, a focus on identity is exposing a rift in values, I, I'd say. Um, you know, I, I sort of characterize that as a rift between, you know, what I describe as the tolerance facing liberal side um, of our denomination and the, and the more justice facing progressive side. Um, and we've, you know, we've seen this conflict at the UUA and in our churches um, and in the emergence of a handful of dissenter groups. So it just seemed like a good moment to revisit an earlier period of conflict. Um, and so so for that reason, I decided to, to talk about the broad church period, which is the um, you know period kind of right after the Civil War. 1865 to 1895, roughly. Um, I've long thought that the broad church period was an interesting period uh, and somewhat neglected. And, and I don't know a whole lot about it myself, <laughs> to, to be honest, um, which is part of part of why I thought it would be interesting to just, you know, just just revisit it. So I kind of took all my books off the shelf and sort of reread, you know, through, uh, you know, what, what the various authors had to say about those years. Um, and you know, for for talking about this period, we I really sort of am at the mercy of the denominational historians, uh, you know, folks like Earl Morris Wilbur, Conrad Wright, David Robinson. The earlier periods that I know better, the sort of the Unitarian period of the early nineteenth century, and then the Transcendentalists. There's just a lot of scholarship about those periods beyond Unitarian authors, right? Um, so you know, with with Channing and the original. Uh, generation of Unitarians, those, those folks are just part of a broader story of Christianity um, in, you know, colonial America and the early Republic. And so there are a lot of Christian historians, uh, including uh, Brooks Holofield, who I studied with at Emory, you know, who uh, have taken an interest in, in in those guys and have talked about, you know, who they were, um, you know, not, not from the perspective of trying to understand them as our forebearers, right? The Transcendentalists obviously are like, you know, one of the great literary movements in American history. <laughs> so tons, tons of scholarship about those folks. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so with the broad church, you know, I, I really am kind of, um, you know, just sort of, sort of rehearsing what I've learned from reading our, our historians, particularly Conrad Wright. And so, you know, my little disclaimers, the, 
the late 19th century is not really my period particularly. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of original research on these folks. You know, I would probably need to like, you know, go to the Massachusetts Historical Society and really dig into archives and stuff, you know. So I agreed to do this because I just, you know, I just wanted to kind of refresh my uh, um, awareness of this particular period. So, so the goals for today, um, I'm going to revisit this history uh, largely as it's been told by the denominational historians. Um, I'm just going to kind of focus on the different sort of theological perspectives and factions that were involved uh, primarily in the creation of the, uh, the National Conference of Unitarian Churches in 1865. Um, and then I'll offer some observations of my own at the end. And uh, and finally, I just wanted to say I sort of have you know I I promised you lessons in the title of this, um, and I'm not I'm not sure exactly what lessons I have to to impart. Um, you know I I don't know how strong the parallels are really between sort of you know this earlier period of conflict and what's happening with us today. Um, and and I certainly don't you know think that there's anything here to you know make predictions about what's what's going to happen in in our future. Um, but I still think that the comparison is interesting. Um, and so I'd be very curious to hear uh, your thoughts when I, uh, when I finish this lecture. So with all of that said, I'm checking the time. Um, so just, just a quick gloss then on, you know, kind of Unitarianism up to 1865, uh, you know, for folks who just haven't uh, you know, kind of revisited this, this, this history. So the original Unitarians, uh, as I said, emerged out of Puritan New England. Um, you know, probably the, the main things to know about the Puritans, um, they were morally severe. Uh, so, you know, these are the scarlet letter people, you know, pilgrims in uncomfortable shoes, you know, um, that you read about in school. They were uh, Calvinists uh, in their theology, uh, which is to say that their theology was, was elaborate and counterintuitive. Um, and they were congregational in their, in their church organization. Um, and I, I won't go into it, but that has a lot to do with sort of how, you know, these, these sort of, uh, you know, these, these, these reformers within the Church of England came to New England and sort of set up their own thing. Um, and, you know, we're trying to kind of avoid the, the corruptions of the, um, you know, the, the, the hierarchy of the church. So, um, so you know, they, they established the congregational polity, which, you know, is, is roughly what we still practice today. Um, by the late 18th century, um, their moral severity had sort of mellowed uh, and just had kind of shifted into this overriding concern with virtue, um, you know, with, with sort of religion, the aim, the aim of the Christian religion being to, you know, sort of develop, uh, you know, people of, of good character. Um, the Calvinism that they had, uh, you know, sort of believed before that held to the strict view of human depravity had actually sort of evolved into a belief that with proper guidance, humans were not so depraved, we're actually capable of behaving well. Um, and so the more liberal congregationalists made virtue the focus of their preaching because they were really just concerned with moral instruction. Um, and they began to ignore the more metaphysical Christian doctrines like the Trinity, because they just didn't think that those things preached well. They just didn't think that they were relevant to moral formation. The, uh, the Orthodox called them out on this, um, accusing them of being Unitarians. And after a couple of decades of hemming and hawing, the liberals finally embraced that label. Um, and the better portion of the congregations in New England became Unitarian congregations. Um, but this identity didn't really necessarily inspire a whole lot of, of zeal for conversion. Um, they didn't, you know, come roaring out of the gate, eager to spread the new word. Uh, for the first half of the 19th century, the Unitarians were still very defensive about the Orthodox critique and eager to demonstrate that they were still Christians. Um, and this was sort of made more difficult because uh, Unitarian New England was ground zero for transcendentalism, um, which was a literary and religious movement that shifted the ground of religion away from the reasoned argument that was characteristic of the first Unitarian generation. Um, and, uh, you know, away from external evidences like, uh, you know, the historical accuracy of the Bible, um, you know, that they still, the early Unitarians still believed in, in literal miracles, you know, that you sort of knew that that Jesus was sort of anointed by God because he actually rose from the dead, you know, and, you know, a, a, a uh, empirical evidence in their mind. Um, and transcendentalism sort of moved religion towards inner inspiration. Um, and so uh, at first, this just meant that the human heart uh, for the transcendentalists provided more reliable confirmation of Christian truth than the Bible. But then more radical transcendentalists came to believe that there was a form of religious truth that was actually higher than sort of prior to Christianity, um, you know, they sometimes refer to it as, as absolute religion. 
um, and that the particular trappings of, of the Christian witness, you know, things like sacraments, the Bible, the ministry of Jesus, were incidental to religion in this higher form. Um, and so the most vocal proponent of this view was Theodore Parker, you may have heard of, um, and the Christian Unitarians were, were mostly pretty hostile to him because, you know, um, they, they found his, uh, you know, his, his sort of denigration of, of historical Christianity, it, it scandalized them in the eyes of the Orthodox, and they, and they still sort of cared what, what other Christians thought. Um, so uh, during this period, there was, there was sort of early, a little bit of organization among the Unitarians, um, but not a ton. Um, the American Unitarian Association had been organized in 1825, um, but it was an organization of individual members who uh, contributed funds in support of publishing and missionary work. So it wasn't a representative body of churches. It wasn't like, you know, uh, the UUA today where, you know, churches are members and send delegates. Um, as, uh, you know, as white Americans were migrating west uh, in the 19th century, Many of them from New England brought their Unitarianism with them. Um, and so there were a handful of Unitarian church plantings um, in usually urban areas in places like Kansas, uh, Detroit, Milwaukee, and San Francisco. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the Meadville Theological School was established in Pennsylvania, Northwest Pennsylvania in 1844. Uh, and there was also uh, a body called the Western Unitarian Conference, which was organized for missionary work in 1852. So there was, you know, some effort to kind of, you know, grow as a denomination. But many of the Unitarian churches back in New England didn't support this missionary work at all, um, particularly those in Boston. You know, they were fairly insular and just didn't necessarily see the spread of the Unitarian, you know, brand, as it were, um, as, as a particular priority. Um, and so this was sort of the situation when the American Civil War broke out in 1960, or in, sorry, 1861. Um, so let me uh, let me now introduce, you know, sort of the main character and all of uh, what came next, um, you know, and sort of the, the, the main fellow whose picture I'm going to show you and whose dates I'm going to give. So this is Henry Whitney Bellows, um, and uh, uh, Bellows was the minister of um, the All Souls Church in New York City. Um, uh, I think I think he became minister in the 1840s there. Um, and so he was, you know, sort of already someone who had a kind of a prominent pulpit in Unitarianism, but outside of New England. Um, and so was, was already sort of positioned to be thinking a little bit more nationally. Um, and uh, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so um, it, it, stepping back in, a bit. It, it took a little while for the for the Unitarians, who, as I said, were very sort of centered on virtue as kind of their religious message, um, to sort of coalesce around the idea that they should be activists for social causes. Um, and so, even though you had early vocal abolitionists like Theodore Parker, as a whole, they were they were slow to embrace, you know, for example, the abolitionist cause. And it was really sort of the inevitability of the Civil War that provided the final catalyst. You know, that they were about to be moving in that direction. And so one effect of the Civil War is that it uh, it inspired Bellows um, to international service uh, as president of something called the United States Sanitary Commission. Um, and that was a, a private relief agency that was formed at the outset of the war in order to support uh, sick and wounded uni uh, Union soldiers. Uh, it, it was basically sort of a precursor to the American Red Cross, right? So they raised funds. Uh, provided supplies to wounded soldiers from from medicine and hospital gowns to uh, you know checkerboards, religious tracts, just anything that soldiers would need. Um, and Bellows was minister of All Souls Church uh, in New York City, as I said. Uh, he was 46 years old when the war broke out, and so he proposed the commission and recruited a number of prominent Unitarians into its leadership. Um, so it wasn't a Unitarian organization per se but it definitely demonstrated the good that Unitarians could do when they united around a common cause. And so after the war, uh, it was Bellows who, you know, had, had, had kind of, you know, learned sort of how to organize things nationally and had, you know, gained a certain amount of national prominence through the Sanitary Commission. Uh, he, he was the one who, who really saw the need for a new organizational body of Unitarians, um, you know, something that was gonna be, be just more fleshed out than the member, the, you know, the individual member American Unitarian Association. So um, 
he got a warrant from the AUA to convene a convention in, 18, in 1865 um, that the Unitarian churches could send delegates to. Um, and so his own vision for sort of what he wanted to see the, um, the uh, denomination become was sort of tied to his assessment of the state of American Protestantism at mid-century. Um, he sort of you know, felt that the Unitarians had become somewhat stagnant and he saw it as part of a broader malaise across uh, Protestant Christianity as a whole, which which he, uh, uh, in a famous address, he called the suspense of faith. Um, and, and essentially, you know, in his view, the, these older, more severe Calvinist doctrines of predestination and so forth uh, had had mostly fallen out of favor, you know, kind of kind of across the board among the mainline denominations. So the rational Unitarian critique of Calvinism was no longer as vital as it had been. And in its place, he thought that liberal Christians needed a revitalized emphasis on the church as an institution of shared ritual and practice with a liberal theological core. And he thought that there was a great opportunity to recruit liberals from various main, mainline sects into a new endeavor. So, so he had a very, a very kind of grand ambition, you know, which was to create sort of a, a broader liberal denomination that would unite Unitarians with, with liberals from other areas. Um, and so, this led in 1865 to the convention in which uh, the um, National uh, Conference of Unitarian Churches was, was founded, um, which took place in New York City in 1865. And, and very interesting, uh, you know, uh, Bellows himself, sort of in his papers um, and in, in his correspondence, you know, he, he, he was very much a politician. And so he sort of made a list of what he saw as all the different factions um, that you know that he wanted to try to to try to uh, unite uh, in this new endeavor. Um, so I'm just going to kind of run through these a little bit and talk about sort of who who they were, um, so that you can kind of get a sense of what the theological diversity was at the time, right? So kind of you know moving from sort of most conservative to most liberal or, or radical. Um, on the conservative end, you had uh, what he what he termed the evangelicals. They were basically, you know, kind of kind of reluctant denominationalists who, who maintained a strong sense of the uniqueness of Christ. Um, and most of these, you know, a number of them were, you know, perhaps Unitarian in their Christology, but otherwise were were pretty, you know, conventionally enthusiastic evangelical Christians. Um, you know, folks who were were a little bit on the fence as to whether they belonged in a liberal denomination. The next faction were uh, what he called the uh, the older rationalists, uh, and you can think of these folks as basically the Channing Unitarians, right? So, the, so that that first initial generation of Unitarians uh, who sort of came out of the Unitarian controversy in eighteen oh five, and they remained uh, committed to um, an explicitly Christian doctrinal basis, and and still sort of adhered to uh, the tenets of uh, what historians have called supernatural rationalism. Which is to say that on the one hand, you know, they were they were sort of Enlightenment, uh, you know, era uh, rationalists, um, you know, followers of, of John Locke's empiricism, but they still believed in a lot of the the miracles and other uh, you know testaments of of the Bible. Um, you know, they just sort of treated those as evidence uh, for 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 the divine warrant of Christianity. Um, in the middle were uh, you know. Uh, the group that that Bellows himself belonged to, and who we're sort of talking about tonight, and this group and this group in the middle were the broad church group, um, and they consisted essentially of um, you know sort of sort of two um, you know two two sort of subgroupings. There were just younger conservatives, right? So you know folks who um, uh, you know also believed strongly in sort of Unitarianism, maintaining a Christian character. But who were not necessarily, uh, you know, the, the the supernatural rationalist types of, of the Channing generation, and then uh, there were there were others who had embraced transcendentalism, but sort of with a with an explicitly Christian flavor, right? So, uh, um, you know, transcendentalists who who did not necessarily move, you know, didn't didn't take that transcendentalist emphasis on inner intuition as a warrant to kind of move outside the bounds of traditional Christianity. But were more inclined to, you know, sort of see uh, the Christian truths as sort of reflecting back through their their you know, their their intuitionist uh, epistemology. And then, uh, and then finally, there were uh, various groups of of radicals, 
Um, and these were the, the the folks who you know were, were were sort of moving beyond the bounds of Christianity, you know. So so you know may may have sort of adhered to Christianity, but but saw it not as necessarily having a special rank, you know, that sort of placed it above other religions. Um, they were uh, you know can be described, I think, fairly as the heirs of Theodore Parker. They weren't necessarily all transcendentalist intuitionists. Um, uh, Francis Ellingwood Abbott sort of uh, further de defined, uh, divided them basically into two schools, um, you know, which he called the uh, the transcendentalist intuitionist school, um, you know, who, uh, who who really sort of believed that you know the, the sort of the truth of religion is kind of kind of imprinted on the heart, um, as you were, and then the uh, what he called the empirical or scientific school, um, you know, who sort of uh, weren't so you know you know sort of sort of were interested in moving beyond Christianity to some broader definition of religion, but they didn't ground that necessarily in personal experience. They grounded that in, uh, you know, just just empirical inquiry. Um, and you can sort of think of those folks as kind of the, you know, the sort of the, the precursors to the humanists, um, you know, who are still with us today. So, uh, um, so th these were sort of the, uh, you know, the the groups um, that uh, Bellows had sort of identified. And so they went into this conference to try to kind of, you know, sort of hash out what this organization was going to be. Um, and so the first thing that the Bellows uh, sort of had to do was, you know, he, he kind of worked uh, to defeat an effort by the uh, by the supranational rationalists, the older rationalists, um, to sort of set the whole thing onto an explicit Christian doctrinal basis. Um, and, and here's a little bit of uh, um, of language from the the, uh, the motion that they tried that was defeated. You know, they they refer to belief in our Lord, Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Son of God, and his specially appointed messenger and representative to our race, gifted with supernatural power, approved of God by miracles and signs and wonders which God did by him, and thus by divine authority, commanding the devout and reverential faith of all who claim the Christian name. Um, so, uh, so, so Bellows, uh, you know, was sort of successful in, in kind of keeping that out <laughs> right so you know so that earlier you know kind of kind of chanting era um uh uh sort of approach to to unitary christianity was at least not going to be binding um sort of on this new organization um but at the same time uh bellows was not able to sort of take this as far as he had hoped right he was really hoping that that uh, this organization would sort of dub itself the liberal church of america um and would be a place that would that would, you know, incorporate both Unitarians, but also, as I said, liberals from other uh, other mainline denominations. Um, but instead, you know, what he got was the National Conference of Unitarian Churches, uh, which, you know, further defined itself in, in the Constitution as Christian churches of the Unitarian faith. So it remained sort of sectarian. There, there, there remained this, this, you know, this allegiance to the Unitarian name. Um, and so uh, uh, so that's that's sort of what they got. And this was a little bit of a disappointment, not just to Bellows, but also to, to uh, some of the radicals, um, you know, because there was still, you know, just just this emphasis on the word Christian uh, in the, um, the constitution of this new conference. Um, and so some of them, uh, you know, either either left entirely or just kind of in parallel uh, formed this group uh, in 1866 that you might have heard of. They were called the Free Religious Association. Um, and so they were, you know, sort of described themselves as, as proponents of, of, you know, absolute religion or free religion sort of outside of the, the, the confines of Christianity. So essentially what, what you saw happen was that, you know, um, they, they, they sort of lost some folks at either end, you know, some of the more just committed evangelicals and, and, and older rationalists uh, left for more conservative churches some of the, you know, the most free thinking radicals kind of decamped for the Free Religious Association or just kind of went off and did their own thing. Um, but uh, but the broad church perspective kind of in the middle um, managed to eke out a compromise that kept a diversity of perspectives in the fold. So so what was the broad church compromise? I, I have two quotes here um, that I will uh, uh, read to you guys, um, you know, that that I think are sort of indicative of the attitude that that Bellows brought um, and that sort of helped to you know kind of create a kind of a tolerant atmosphere um he basically just has there, there are two different metaphors here both of which I really like <laughs> so that's why I wanted to share these um the first is the metaphor of the compass um and uh you know 
basically what, what Bell has wrote to, uh, to James Freeman Clark, who was uh, another one of the broad church ministers. He said, we want to describe a large enough circle to take in all who really belong with us and provided one and the fixed leg of the compasses is in the heart of Jesus Christ, I care about how wide and far the other wanders. Um, so I really love that that image of the compass, right? You know, the, sort of the um, um, uh, you know the tool for drawing a circle. You know, as, as long as sort of the heart of the compass kind of stays, you know, sort of sort of with the Christian message. He you know he, he was he was willing to let the other leg of the compass roam as wide as it needed to roam in order to you know sort of uh, make welcome uh, you know in, in any any others who were you know uh, felt like they belonged uh, kind of together with with these these folks in a, in a broader Unitarian. Um, broader Unitarian movement. The, the other quote uh, was just kind of, you know, something that he said regarding uh, the, the, the various factions and their approaches to truth. Um, he said, I, I am, I believe, on both sides of all great questions, because truth rides a horseback. Her limbs are invisible to each other and in opposite stirrups, but her trunk is one. Um, so I just, I really sort of love that idea of, you know, you know, the sort of the, the truth of the Christian Unitarians on the one hand and then the free religionists on the other as being sort of like, you know, two legs of a rider that, you know, are on opposite sides of a horse, so they can't really see each other, but, you know, sort of all, all, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, belong to sort of a, sort of a greater truth. Um, so, uh, to talk a little bit more about the, the broad church compromise then, um, the sort of the defining attitudes that uh, um, this sort of went into this uh, into this compromise. So it, they retained a sort of a primary Christian commitment. Um, you know, as as that that quote about the compass kind of uh, you know kind of kind of indicates. Um, more more than that, you know, and so so they shared that, of course, you know, with the evangelicals and the the older rationalists. Um, but more than that, they the um, the broad church folks really emphasized uh, a very strong sense of the importance of the church itself as an institution. Um, and this, I think, you know, was, was, you know, what, what really kind of, you know, helped them to cohere over against the free religionists. They were, you know, in, in talking about the church, they tended to be, um, you know, somewhat, uh, uh, um, you know, dismissive of or sort of wary of the kind of the excessive individualism um, that you know, sort of transcendentalist or free religionist kinds of approaches could 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 proffer. They just they saw the church as something vital. Um, they saw it as as part of you know the divine mission um, and uh, uh, um, and something that was that was sort of greater than simply a school of philosophy or, or sort of a debating club. You know, there, there was a sort of a vitality to it. Um, you know, sort of a, a spirit to it um, that that uh, you know that, that they sort of emphasized. And furthermore, there was this strong emphasis on um, historical continuities in religion. Um, and this was, you know, uh, again, a, a little bit over and against, you know, both the um, the sort of the early uh, kind of um, supranational rationalists, the sort of the Channing generation. But also the transcendentalists, you know, ni neither of them had really put all that much of an emphasis on sort of thinking about how the Christian message sort of moves through history. Um, the 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 early Unitarians, you know, sort of saw the truths of the Bible as eternal. You know, they 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 recognized that there had been a historical, um, you know, Jesus, and and they believed that 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 person had performed miracles. Walked on water, risen from the dead, you know, and so and so they saw a sort of historical evidence, but they weren't particularly, but they but they mostly saw the church as a kind of an eternal thing. They weren't particularly concerned with sort of how it had evolved, and then the transcendentalists, you know, particularly sort of the you know the more literary transcendentalists uh, like Emerson, their you know their attitude towards history was uh, um, was that it was really kind of something to transcend, <laughs> you know, that there was sort of like a a greatness, a sort of a you know a, a a heartbeat of originality and that, you know, sort of like true religion uh, required kind of transcending your historical circumstances in order to, uh, to touch that. Um, what the broad church folks saw was that they just, they saw, you know, the, the, the fact that the Christian church had kind of, you know, come to be what it was, you know, particularly sort of in its Unitarian incarnation 
as um, as something to be celebrated and something to you know kind of kind of kind of lean into um, you know as sort of a pragmatic matter. Um, and so uh, so that sort of historical you know just kind of the fact that the church had had come to be what it was they saw as evidence for um, you know the, the sort of the importance of the church as a vehicle right. Um, and interestingly, you know, the broad church uh, um, uh, compromise, it incorporated uh, both the sort of the, the empiricist um, perspectives, right, that were that were you know, more kind of evidence based um, and intuitionist perspectives that were more transcendentalist, um, they were more centered in, in human feeling and sentiment. Um, if you sort of go back and look at, you know, sort of the, the controversies over Emerson's Divinity School address and over uh, Theodore Parker's transient and permanent Christianity, you know, you would have thought that the sort of the dividing line here would have been between the uh, the, the rationalist camps, um, you know, um, uh, and, and the intuitionist camps. Um, you would think that that's sort of what would have divided the, the, the broad church and the Unitarians from the pre-religionists, but that's not really true. There were, there were in, intuitionists on both sides of that uh, divide, um, and there were empiricists on both sides of that divide. So what divided them was not was was really sort of the necessity again of the church um, of you know the need to to have something that was more than just a school of religious uh, philosophy. Um, so now I've I've titled these two slides uh, compromise um, because there was still considerable tension between these various factions, and I'm now going to just kind of quickly skim over thirty years <laughs> from you know from the 1860s to the 1890s. Um, to just you know, to just say uh, you know some some of the um, you know the, the 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 points that were still just kind of sore points. So so in this period, there was considerable tinkering, sort of year after year at these conferences with the language in the National Conference Constitution, and you know, and just lots of sort of bickering and back and forth between the you know the the, the folks who sort of wanted to you know hold on to some grounding in Christian character, you know. By which I mean the, the the Christian character of the Unitarian Church, and the and the the free religionists or the sort of the anti creedal folks who just you know didn't want anything that smacked to them like a creed or you know or a doctrine that would sort of commit them to Christianity. Um, another incident that sort of happened in this period is something that uh, uh, is has come to be known as the the yearbook controversy, um, which just kind of briefly was this this. Uh, really this misunderstanding among the American Unitarian Association. One, one of the secretaries of the association, uh, you know, basically um, took it upon himself to uh, to sort of ask the, the various ministers who were in this this publication that they, they did every year called the yearbook, right? It was just like a, a directory of ministers around the, around the, the country, um, you know, whether they still consider themselves Christian or not, and sort of took it upon himself to drop the ones who said no um, which was not what most of them intended. And, you know, so that, that created a big stink because uh, they felt like they were being, you know, sort of sort of maligned and, and you know, communicated in a way. Um, so so that happened. Um, and then, you know, there were there were just various back and forths uh, between the sort of the, the, the slightly more free religionist leaning folks uh, in the West um, and the, the, you know, the, the, the sort of more traditional Christian folks uh, kind of back east in New England. Um, you know, one uh, famous publication you may have heard of, there was a minister named uh, Jabez T. Sunderland who wrote uh, a tract called The Issue in the West, um, you know, just sort of taking the, the free religionists to task for um, their, you know, sort of trying to, to, to turn religion simply into ethics, right? Um, arguing that an ethical basis for religion was not enough, that you, that you needed a, um, an actual Christian witness. So, um, uh, so, so, you know, for, for 30 years, basically, there was kind of, you know, this, this sort of tension um, among the, the Unitarian churches over just the, you know, just how accepting they were of free religion, how Christian they were ultimately. Um, and it was just kind of a, it was, it was sort of a simmering thing until uh, 1894, um, when there's this, uh, um, uh, you know, this, this conference that happened in Saratoga, um, New York, when, where you know they finally sort of managed to come up with um, language that sort of was acceptable to to every faction, um, and and here and here is sort of what they eventually sort of passed. Um, you know, uh, 
Uh, I'll just I'll just read this paragraph to you. These churches accept the religion of Jesus, holding in accordance with his teaching that practical religion is summed up in love to God and love to man. The conference recognizes the fact that its constituency is congregational in tradition and polity. Therefore, it declares that nothing in this constitution is to be construed as an authoritative test. And we cordially invite to our working fellowship any who, while differing from us in belief, are in general sympathy with our spirit and our practical needs. Um, and so this, uh, um, this statement uh, passed unanimously uh, to sort of great uh, relief and applause. And there was just this kind of general feeling among everyone that, you know, they, they had sort of had finally kind of cracked the code, you know, had figured out a way to describe, um, you know, sort of Unitarianism in, in a way that, you know, essentially, I think, you know, even even though uh, Bellows uh, was was about 10 years dead at this point, um, you know, really honored his his view of the compass, right? Um, you know, you know, accepting the, the religion of Jesus, having one leg, uh, you know, of, of the compass sort of in that tradition, but then also, you know, um, you know, cordially inviting to our working fellowship any who, while differing from us in belief, are in general sympathy with our spirit and our practical. So the kind of the, the practical, um, you know, need of having a denomination sort of one out, right? Um, and so, you know, why why did this happen? Um, you know, why were they sort of finally able to, um, you know, kind of put these divisions to to rest? You know, after sort of thirty years. And so, uh, so Conrad Wright, um, in in his uh, uh, essay about all of this, and, and uh, the Unitarian history, a stream of light. Um, Conrad Wright op offers sort of three basic reasons for for why you know they were finally able to to put differences aside and reach consensus. Um, the first is just that the more the more hardline personalities in the various factions had mellowed out um, with age, um, or or had died or had retired. Um, so you know a lot of a lot of the sort of the stubbornness, which you know is just often personal in situations like this. Um, uh, you know, it just kind of resolved itself um, uh, by, uh, you know, by just the, the, the progress of time. Um, the second reason I think is more interesting, which is that the, the National Conference of Churches um, and the American Unitarian Association, which by this point had become more of a, of a representative delegate body than it had been at the outset, that they had basically demonstrated the effectiveness of denominational bodies. Um, and so, you know, the, the fact that there was were, was now, after sort of 30 years, a, you know, a, a fairly robust and successful um, national office um, sort of proved that there was kind of a usefulness to being together, uh, sort of among all these different factions. Um, and they had, you know, they, they, had, they had bought the, um, the offices uh, on, uh, um, on, on Beacon Street in Boston, I think in the 1880s is sort of when that had happened. Um, and, you know, there just had been uh, um, a whole spate of organizations of kind of, you know, Unitarian uh, groups to work on various issues. Um, and those those groups have sort of proven their usefulness to, to, to everyone. Um, and, then the, and then the final reason that, that Wright is um, kind of going back to what I was saying a little bit earlier about historical, the, the emphasis on historical development, this, you know, this kind of historical development and continuity paradigm had become a sort of a dominant theme in late 19th century thought across the board. Um, and so, uh, you know, Wright sort of credits that, you know, the, the sort of the, 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 the kind of the pragmatic sense of just like, well, you know, here we are, we just seem to have happened. We are a church, you know, let's figure out how to sort of productively be a church together um, as being sort of one of the attitudes that really sort of helped to cement all of, all of this um, and to resolve these conflicts. Um, so, um, some final thoughts then. I got a slide that said final thoughts, but it's not coming up. Um, so, uh, I will open the, the floor to questions in a minute. I know I, this was kind of a, a whole lot of, of information, um, you know, that I went through. Um, but what I find inspiring about the broad church is that spirit of inclusivity. Um, that you find, you know, particularly in those quotes from Bellows about the compass and the quote about the you know, truth riding a horseback. Um, you know, there was just this this desire 
kind of understandably to, to ground the association in its particular Christian roots. Because again, you know, most Unitarians at this point were still yeah, very definitely Christians in their own, you know, self-conception. But at heart, there was also just this desire to bring as many people into the fold as possible. So there's a kind of a generosity to it, um, you know, that I, that I think uh, is, is really sort of inspiring. And to that end, I think that it's it's notable that they had a robust doctrine of the church. Um, I think that that's kind of a key sort of takeaway here. Um, you know, and, and it helped, of course, at this stage that, you know, the, the Unitarians still primarily thought of themselves as Christians because the church, you know, has a particular place in Christian theology. If you've, you know, if you've studied any sort of systematic Christian theology, gone to divinity school, or even just taken a Christian the theological uh, overview class, you know, uh, as an undergraduate or something, um, you know, you'll know that ecclesiology is, you know, it's, it's sort of one of the, the big subjects of Christian theology. And there's a whole lot of thought behind it. Uh, you know, Christians don't just sort of have churches as, as a matter of convenience, you know, because they just sort of like to get together. But, you know, but it's, you know, it's it's kind of mandated uh, in, in the Bible, really, that, that there be a Christian church. And so it's understood as this divinely ordained vehicle for God's work in the world. Um, and the broad church folks still sort of had that, right? You know, there was just this 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 ability to, you know, kind of to pull back from the the individualism of, of transcendentalism and to say, like, no, they're just, you know, there needs to be a church. And so we need to kind of work together to figure out sort of what that's gonna be, you know, who, who we are gonna sort of be together, right? And so, you know, so thinking about that, you know, the sort of the, the, the desire for a church and sort of the way that a denomination kind of demonstrated to them that it made sense for them to cohere as a church. In some sense, I think that, that, you know, our situation today is kind of the opposite of, of their situation. Um, you know, because for them, you know, it was the success of the denomination that demonstrated commonalities that they had as individual churches and spurred them towards unity. Whereas today, I think, you know, um, we we have sort of a disconnect uh, between what happens at the denominational level, the sort of the conversation that happens there and what happens in our churches. Um, and, you know, and I sort of, you know, I, I have a uh, sort of a strong sense of the importance of churches, but a somewhat modest sense of their mission in the world. Which is that I think that you know our churches are are there to help us to care for one another and and to provide service to our communities. I think that that's sort of their their essential mission. Um, and that conversation of sort of like you know what what needs to happen to to you know to just do that right you know to to do the pledge drives to organize the caring circles to you know sort of bring bring food to people who who you know who are who are sick and need it that kind of stuff. Um, you know, is it's it's very different from the the kind of the the arguing about big issues. You know, that sort of happens uh, at at uh, our general assembly. Um, and so, you know, as as Stephen sort of mentioned in his introduction, I used to be very involved in young adult and campus ministry, um, and uh, and you know, and and was involved at the denominational level. So I I went to like like twelve GAs in a row, <laughs> I think from. From '91, which was my first one, until the early 2000s, sometime 12 or 13 of these things, um, and you know, and I and I found the kind of the resolution passing and declaration making to be a, just a little bit absurd a lot of the time, and so like a lot of you use, I tended to sort of tune it out, um, and and I think that you know one of our challenges is that there's sort of there's a dogmatism at the denominational level that I think really hampers uh, you know churches in their mission when that when that dogmatism sort of kind of comes down to the to the local level. Um, and so I think that, you know, that that's, that's, that's sort of one of the challenges that, that, you know, that we're facing today. It's a little bit opposite of sort of what was happening in the late 19th century. Um, one thing that I do think is sort of interesting is that the, you know, the, kind of the, the illiberal anti-oppression, um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of thinking that has been very divisive among us has actually latched onto a kind of a new language to describe the church. Um, which is which is that of beloved community, um, and I find I find that really kind of fascinating. And I, uh, I I think you know I think I think it's it's I don't know it's interesting. I don't know exactly what to make of it. I find it a little curious. Um, I'm not sure that I entirely understand it. I think that it's you know it's sort of meant to evoke this need for sort of transforming church, right? Which which is you know which which kind of implies some sort of an idea of what church 
is or should be that it isn't now. Um, and I think that that sort of needs to be sort of sort of unpacked. Um, you know, I you know I know for my own part, I, I do feel like we do have an obligation to be a safe and welcoming space in our church uh, for people who have trouble finding comfortable homes in other religions. You know, whether it's because of of you know sort of sort of identity issues or or you know or or, or other uh, you know ways in which they just don't fit in. Um, I just think that, you know, in order to do that successfully, we need to be open to a plurality of views in addition to a plurality of identities. And so I feel like, you know, that's that's kind of the 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 one little takeaway. I don't know, I don't know if you call it a lesson necessarily. Um, but you know, the, the one thing that I take away from revisiting this is that there's just this question about church. It was very central to this conversation in the late 19th century. Um, and I think that it's sort of something for us to kind of, you know, sort of sort of really put some thought into today. Is you know what what is our vision for church? Why is church necessary? Why is it important for us to be together? Can we articulate that in a way that you know sort of sort of uh, you know articulates the the need for us to sort of retain our traditional liberalism? Um, you know, and and if so, sort of what does that look like? So so that's kind of the question that I would sort of sort of leave uh, you know uh, you guys with uh, for for tonight. Ah, so let me uh, let me stop my screen share uh, so you can see my face again. Um, that is my presentation. Um, I hope it wasn't too super dense. <laughs>